Hello everyone, and welcome to our first whiteboard session. Here at Judo Payments, we really pride ourselves on working with our customers to help them understand card payments and make sure that we are there to best help you grow your business. And this is the first in a series of conversations where we're going to share with you some of our knowledge about the card payments industry. We try to do everything we can to make payments as simple as possible, but it's important that you understand what's going on behind the scenes so that you can structure some of your business processes in the right way to take advantage of what we offer you. Of course, what we go through here today is only an introduction, and we're always here to help. Give us a call, drop us an email, we'll come visit you, or we'll talk to you over the phone, and we'll help make payments as simple as it can be. The first thing we want to talk to you about is all of the complicated players that exist within making a card payment. And most of this you don't need to think about, but it gets confusing and sometimes we get a lot of uh, questions around who actually is involved in a card transaction. So I want to walk you through a simple process and then we'll talk about a few different types of transactions and how those change the process. So behind me on the board I've got a simple diagram that shows the folks who are involved in a card payment. First, and most importantly, we have your customer. And your customer is carrying some sort of a credit card in their wallet or maybe in their brain if they've me memorized the number. They're the ones who are saying, I'm going to provide money for this good or service and I'm going to use a credit card to initiate that payment. From the consumer, you have the merchant. And so in this case, we've drawn a picture of a taxi. It's just because it's easier to draw than what most of our customers sell. Um, and the taxi merchant is the driver or the taxi company and they need to accept payment for the good or service they're delivering. In order to accept payments, the merchant needs to be signed up with Visa and MasterCard, which are commonly called the card schemes. These are networks that connect thousands and thousands or millions actually of cardholders with millions of merchants around the world and help us move around different environments and different geographies and use the same cards to pay. They aren't actually holding any of the funds. All they do is provide the communication infrastructure be between various parties. So back to that merchant who's got that relationship with Visa and MasterCard. In order to do that, they have to go through what's called an acquiring bank. An acquiring bank is someone who takes responsibility for the merchant to be able to accept card payments. We'll come back to that in a, little, in a minute. For all intents and purpose, Judo is the acquiring bank when we work with our customers. And I'll talk about it in a few seconds with different types of transactions. There's actually a few folks who are often involved here. Over back to the customer side or the cardholder side of the equation, they've been issued this card by what's called an issuing bank. So this is the bank that's saying, I'm going to take responsibility for the credit worthiness of this cardholder. And when they present their card for payment, I'm going to make sure that, that those funds are guaranteed back to you. Again, this is all done through Visa and MasterCard and the schemes, as they're known. So let's take an example of a transaction that goes through and show how the flow of uh, information and then funds goes through these different parties. So step one, the customer takes out their card and they begin to process a payment. And we're going to leave aside for now whether that's a card present payment, so that would be a chip and pin here in the UK and most of um, the world outside of North America, or if it's what's called a card not present payment, which is um, primarily, if not exclusively, what Judo does. And we do that through m-commerce and other folks do that through e-commerce. But again, for now, let's simplify. And they've somehow presented their information to pay. That information goes to the acquiring bank. So the acquiring bank receives that information and immediately passes it through to Visa and MasterCard, who pass it on to the issuing bank. At that point, the issuing bank says, is there enough credit in this person's account? Was the card stolen? And do I feel comfortable with this transaction? You know, maybe it, it's occurring in Dubai, and my customer, my cardholder has never been to Dubai, so I don't think they're there right now. You've probably had this happen to you when you travel. In short, they'll respond with a message that says, yes, they have enough money, no, the card has not been stolen, and yes, we guarantee that we're going to provide these funds. 
Visa and MasterCard then go and route that message back to the acquiring bank. And that acquiring bank routes the message back to the cardholder card holder, through some sort of an interface. And again, we'll come back to this in a second on what that interface can be. So this is just bits and bytes on data passing through and telling us whether or not a card or a transaction can take place. At the end of the day, this transaction is settled. And that means the issuing bank is going to take the funds that were paid and get them to the acquiring bank. This is all done in batch transactions, it's done overnight, it's things that you probably don't need to worry about. But at that uh, point, the funds come from the issuing bank, they're sent again through Visa and MasterCard, who take their cut, which is known as interchange, and goes to the acquiring bank, who eventually gives it to the merchant. And here, you've usually got some fees here. You've got the interchange fees here. And the issuing bank also gets to charge fees because they're providing that service. So, a lot of people involved in accepting a card payment. And while this may seem very complex and there's a lot of talk about, well, why should we be paying all this money to process through card payments? This network is very, very secure. And most importantly, if something goes wrong for either the merchant or the cardholder, there's an established known process for working through any sort of disputes. And that's really what makes these card schemes so powerful, is that they can help globally, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, settle a dispute in a known manner. But let's come back here for a second in um, what we've really simplified, which is the relationship between the cardholder and the mer merchant. And before we talked about two different types of transactions. We called it a card present, which CP, or in the UK and the EU, chip and pin, or what's known as card not present. And card not present has nothing to do with whether the customer is there. It has everything to do with whether someone's entered their pin on an EMV certified chip and pin device. EMV being the uh, standards that everybody's agreed to into how we will accept a transaction through this process. So let's start with a chip and pin. You're all probably used to this and what happens. You stick your card into some sort of a ugly reader. On there is going to be a key pin pad where you're going to enter your pin and hope nobody looks over your shoulder. And then that data comes through usually some level of a gateway. And that gateway is taking the information that comes out of this chip and pin machine and passes it in a format that everybody down here understands. In the old days, that was a dial-up gateway. So it was calling up much like we used to maybe use a dial-up internet service. But now it's much more frequently done through a kind of connected uh, device to the, basically the internet. This is considered highly secure because the customer has provided their PIN. And it's provided the PIN against the chip that's in the card and it's done a dual authentication of the transaction. This is the lowest cost method of accepting payments. And it's low cost because there's a low risk of fraud. So everybody down here knows that it's very unlikely that this card was stolen and used in an unusual manner um, in ways that we wouldn't be able to pick up in the fraud algorithms that work in each one of these stages. Things get quite a bit more complex when you get into this card not present environment. And again, card not present has nothing to do with whether the individual is in front of the merchant. They can be sitting in the taxi. It has everything to do with whether or not chip and pin was used. So let's take um, the, the most easy, common, uh, and understandable card not present transaction. And that would be anything you buy online. So when you go online, you've gone to a merchant's website. And so let's ignore the taxi driver right now. Um, actually, let's use the taxi driver example and go see so you've gone to their website to pre-book a ride to come home from the airport. You log on to their website and on their website they're going to have some sort of a form where they're capturing your card details. They'll take those card details and now you're doing this through kind of some sort of a website, hopefully secure it, and that data is going to go through to something that's called a gateway. A gateway 
is a company, a type of company that was created in order to take card not present transactions and allow them to route through this existing infrastructure. It seems like something that the acquiring banks should have been able to do. The problem is that all of the infrastructure built down here is on technology that was from the 70s and 80s. It's highly secure and highly robust, but it's very difficult for them to change. And so when people moved from using card present transactions onto paying for things in the internet with tons of different browsers and formats and ways that data came across, it created an opportunity for companies called gateways to come in to streamline that data and present it back through this network in a way that they could understand. Most gateways perform on a um, per transaction cost. They'll often do a monthly fee and then they'll take uh, every transaction above a certain amount is charged at usually it's around 10 to 20p a transaction. So this ends up becoming an added step because you've still got the acquiring bank involved. In the mobile world, you've got the same thing essentially. It's a gateway that's within a mobile app that's allowing you to process the payments. So what Juno does for you, to make it very simple, is we combine the gateway all the way down to the acquiring bank to keep our fees low, to keep the process simple, and to make sure that you get the best deal possible when you're going to interact with this highly complex network. So again, at Judo, we want to make this as simple as possible. Thanks for tuning in for our first whiteboard session. Hopefully you've learned a lot today, but if there's any questions that have come out of this or anything you at all about payments, don't hesitate to contact us. Follow the links on our site or call the phone number at the bottom of our page and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can and do all we can to help your business grow with Judo. Cheers.